those who have joined um, already. Thanks for joining us here as audience today. Uh, as you can see, uh, Brandon uh, uh, Chan is here as well, who is going to talk about the topic. Hi, Melinda. Uh, Hi. Nice to meet you. Uh, great what you found for chat. So a few words about how we can work together, even you as an audience. Uh, I would be happy to see you all as a, on a video here, uh, of course. So now it's just not the case, but uh, once you have questions, I can invite you to be panelists so you can join us also visually. Be prepared for that. And uh, for, for the rest of you, um, you can ask questions all the time. Don't hesitate and you can do it uh, in two ways. You can either use the chat. So if you look, uh, if you're not familiar with uh, Zoom, look at the navigation bar and there's an icon for chat there. If you click there, you can just post a short message, a longer message if you like. Uh, more interesting for the general discussion uh, would be if you use F and A. So for the, for the questions, uh, Q and A. Use that if you if you open that you can see there are different tabs there. Uh, if you post something like a question, it will show up here. I, I watch all the time if there are questions from you guys, and I will ask Brendan for questions once I see it it fits to to his uh, talk at the moment. And um, you can people can uh, upvote questions or can downvote questions if you think that should be asked anyway. And we try to answer all the questions you have. Um, in the end, or during the session. So you can always uh, feel free to, to ask questions if you like to. Uh, I, I mentioned Brenton already, but we're going to record the session. So it will be available later on. I will post it on the YouTube channel of AI Swiss. So it will be available um, probably tomorrow. It's pretty fast uh, this time. It's less difficult than the time when we met uh, physically in Zurich because I don't have to um, take the video and uh, transform it into, decode it into something which can use be on the web. Okay, great, so we can start now. Um, Brenton, really happy uh, to have you here as a speaker today. Can you say a few words, what you're doing actually on a day-by-day -day base? Yeah, of course. So uh, yeah, thanks for everyone for, for being here and uh, coming to this talk. Uh, thanks very much, Stefan, for having me talk to this group. I'm very excited to talk about uh, XLM Roberta. Uh, but yeah, I can, I can give a little bit of a description of sort of what my background is and what I do. Um, I'm a machine learning engineer at DeepSet and we're a startup based in Berlin and we focus on deep learning for natural language processing. So uh, on a day-to-day -day kind of basis, I'm working a lot with um, transformer-based language models, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. So yeah, uh, deep models such as BERT. And um, we're doing everything involved with that, including training for them from scratch. We uh, created the German BERT uh, a little while ago, um, and we're actually working on building better and better language models for German over time. And um, yeah, trying to just kind of keep up pace with uh, the latest in the field of NLP. Um, DeepSet is also very interesting. So we've been doing a lot of project work for a lot of different clients from um, uh, classification tasks to uh, to maintenance logs, looking at maintenance logs. Um, and currently actually we're very interested in the possibilities in question answering and uh, how that can help enterprises um, search through their uh, stacks of documents in a much smarter kind of way. So uh, yeah, that's who, who we are and what we do. My background's very much in languages and um, in linguistics. I have, I did my master's at Stanford in computational linguistics and that's where I really developed this love the technology around language and what you can do with that. And um, yeah, that's really kind of where I got my training in all things deep learning and natural language processing. And, uh, yeah, I'll be talking more about that. In this talk. So you moved from the US here or, um, to Berlin? Or? Yeah, that's right. Uh, before Berlin, I was in, uh, in the Bay Area for two years. doing my Oh, yeah. yeah. Exciting. Okay. And uh, you just decided to go to Berlin, Berlin because it's a it's a cool city or what was the reason actually? It has a mix of everything actually. It's, firstly, it's, it is a beautiful city and has a lot of very interesting uh, artistic uh, circles and so on. Uh, but also there's a very strong startup scene here. A lot of uh, yeah. very engaged AI people. Um, the team at Zalando is excellent. There's Spacey who are here as well and um, lots of other deep learning based companies who are here that we interact with. 
Hi, awesome, cool. Uh, Brent, before we start, and actually you start maybe to, to talk and present, uh, start with presentation, I would like to share um, some information about uh, also what's next. I'm going to share my screen for a second. Uh, you all know the website, right? Mm -hmm. So here, um, we're going to hear more about uh, non-English NLP, so the language models Brandon has been talking about before. Uh, I, yesterday I just set up um, a new um, talk, uh, April the 23rd, which uh, will be about deep, deep reinforcement learning. Uh, Saura Phil China, so is actually still located in San Francisco, still Bay Area, and uh, who works for um, Uber at the moment. And of course we have a May, uh, May um, conference call as well. So feel free to join us and uh, happy now to, to have Brenton here. Ben, if you would like to start, we are all ears. Great, awesome. Let me just set up the screen sharing then. Okay, how's that? Perfect. Great. Let's start from the beginning then. All right, cool. Yes, so thanks very much for that introduction. Um, I wanna to talk today about uh, XLM Roberta. I wrote um, a small article about it on Medium not too long ago, and um, I think it got quite a lot of people quite excited about the possibilities with um, multilingual language models and what that can bring to people who are working in NLP, uh, but not necessarily with English. So what's been happening in the world of NLP right now? Um, there's been a lot going on in the last two years, and it's actually a really exciting time to be in this field. So, um, yeah, especially the last two years, I think, has been uh, particularly exciting for, for us. Um, for me, just a big landmark in the development of, of NLP and deep learning-based NLP is the This is the language model that was released by Google in November 2018. And overnight, it became the state-of-the-art in 11 different NLP tasks. This is one model which was able to handle everything from classification to named entity recognition to question answering. Um, it was a huge breakthrough and a lot of people described it as the image net moment for NLP. Um, and yeah, there have been lots of activity since then, lots of different angles being taken, lots of new research and language models have become bigger, they've become better, They've become more accessible. And um, yeah, this leaves the question for a lot of people. Um, what does this bring for people who are doing NLP in a language that is not English? Because actually, it has to be noted that often when people say development in NLP, what they really mean is NLP as applied to English. Bert was trained uh, on English and evaluated on English tasks what kind of models are there out there which will help us, for example, with German or French or something much less resourced like uh, Nepali or something like that. And uh, XLM Roberta is one of the big steps in closing this gap. It's really bringing a lot of the power that these big models have and scaling it, not just in terms of the amount of data that it covers or the domains that it covers, but the languages that it covers as well. And the possibilities that this opens are actually really, really exciting. And I think more and more we see NLP practitioners really working on NLP for as many languages as possible. So I wanna break up this talk into two sections. I wanna talk a little bit more generally about uh, what is a language model? I keep using this term, how does it fit into an NLP pipeline? Why is there so much focus on this? And then in the second half of it, we'll talk about multilingual language models, which is what XLM uh, Roberta is. So I think just to start, um, it'd be good to just show a couple of tasks, show what I mean when I talk about NLP and what is possible with a well-trained deep neural network. And to do that, I want to switch over to this demo, which is something that uh, we at DeepSet have created. And uh, we've implemented three different tasks here, uh, document classification, named entity recognition, and question answering. 
Uh, all three of these are implemented using yeah, a, a BERT or a German BERT model. Um, and yeah, we can kind of see the kind of tasks that you might want to tackle with these models. So let's here, for example, use uh, this German BERT model that we uh, trained. Uh, we might have a passage in German about Tour de France. And um, to be honest, this demo could do a little bit of improvement, but um, if your model is tra well trained and reads something like this, it might come back and say, I have very high confidence that this, this is an article about sport. Um, I encourage you to actually try this demo site out in your own time. Uh, you can actually type in whatever text you want in here and see if this is actually a live system that's running. Um, but yeah, for example, maybe uh, you're talking about Spanish elections and then the model would have to try to make a prediction out of that as well and say that I think this is a document that is talking about uh, international affairs. Oh, just one question, Brandon. So did yeah. you set up a website? Did you call it or who, who build a website here? Yeah, the team at DeepSet, uh, we created this. So uh, oh, yeah. I was uh, more on the training, the model side of things, but then the rest yes. of the team uh, built this website, uh, set up the APIs and so on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that link will take you to a live website that you can try out for yourself. So yeah, that's document classification, a very common task in the world of NLP. Um, another one that has been quite exciting and has uh, received a lot of the benefit of um, BERT and these better language models is named entity recognition. So let's once again start off with uh, the German BERT model. Uh, it's been trained on a certain NER data set. And uh, maybe we have a message from, um, from some kind of client. And here we might run the system over this and it will be able to, a good system will be able to pick out that Mering Dam 10 uh, refers to a location, uh, 10969 Berlin is also a location, and that P Henninger is probably a person. Um, and as I mentioned before, the task that we at DeepSet are actually most focused on right now, something called question answering. We find this really quite a cool application of NLP models and something that has gotten a lot better once again over, over the last couple of years is people have built these, uh, built and improved these transformer based language models. So uh, once again, we're going to start with BERT, but this time with an English model. And perhaps we have um, a passage that is a company description. So here, this is a paragraph from the Wikipedia page of Airbus. And we might have a question such as what are the divisions of Airbus? And it's the job of this system to highlight the section in the passage which answers this very question. Um, and once again, I wanna emphasize that this is a live system that you can type in different questions in here and uh, it will have to on the fly try to answer it. And yeah. Brent and I have uh, questions already, but yeah, that fit quite well. So I wanna ask, uh, do you have a demo website open source? I mean, the uh, uh, code available? It's probably just the demo version that you can Use parts where there's no code available, right? Um, we actually have an API. So this is built on our uh, open source framework, which is called Farm. Uh, let me see if I can just quickly put this up. Oh, that's the name of the open source framework, okay. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And in there, we have support for an API, and a, I believe we currently have a basic front end for it as well. Yeah, there we go, showcase models. So actually, it is open source, and I would encourage you to check out our, um, yeah, exactly, that GitHub link, uh, which will run you through how to train models, but also how to present them in the start. Um, one question is from Arland is asking, how do you choose document classification when documents have more than 1,000 characters? Yeah, sure. Um, there are different strategies to this. Uh, I think the most default one is, uh, yeah, so you mentioned 1,000 characters. Um, this is in in the in the style of models that we use. There is a limit to how long a document you can feed it in one go. And uh, practically speaking, for these models that we've been using, um, it's counted on a token level, uh, which is a token is sometimes a word, sometimes it's a part of a word, like a, a morpheme of a word. And practically speaking, they usually can cover about 512 tokens in one go. So one strategy, if you have a very long passage, is to simply cut it 
at 512 and you just uh, do your analysis based on that. But if you really want to do something a little bit more complex, uh, this is a tactic that's using question answering. You can have a sliding window approach. So maybe you look at the first 512 tokens and then you look at another 512 tokens, but starting from some sort of offset, maybe starting from 128. And so you look at each one of these windows individually, and then based on the predictions on each of these, you make one final prediction that applies to the long document, something along those lines. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for those questions. Um, yes. So yeah, this is question answering. Uh, we think this is a really, really cool application of it. And this is built off of a data set called Squad, um, which has like 130,000 examples of these question and passage pairs. And you can build some really cool systems out of it. Um, and actually, I think that there's a lot of work in NLP right now. A lot of people are very interested in this and seeing where it can be, um, where it can go. And people are making harder versions of it. Um, so yeah, definitely um, a very exciting area of NLP. But going back to the slides, uh, yeah, you've seen that like we can do a lot of different kind of tasks uh, in NLP. And you might ask, what is it that we need to build a system which can perform these tasks? And in the most kind of in a very high level view of this, uh, I would break it down into a couple of components. So here, we might have some kind of text input starting from the bottom. I've got an example here of just thinking machines have, and it goes on. Um, and you would want to tokenize this first. So instead of just having a long continuous string of characters, you might want to break it down into meaningful components, which a model has perhaps seen before, has trained on before, and has learned something about over time. Um, then we have this middle component, which is the language model which is converting these tokens into vectors, which is what I have represented in those green bars. So what I mean by that is one token, uh, we might want to represent that in some sort of set of numbers in a vector, uh, which is something that a computer or a program can operate on much more easily. And that's the job of the language model in the most basic sense. Let's turn tokens into a set of numbers which somehow represent it in a good way. Um, so, one kind of, uh, to give you a sense of sort of the, this process, one kind of good indication of whether a language model is working well or not, is that similar words, words which have similar meanings should receive similar vectors. The language model should give similar vectors for these sorts of words. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about sort of what a language model does and how it does it. Um, but yeah, once you have these vectors, which each represent one of your tokens, you want to pass that on to a prediction head, which gives a final um, prediction. And yeah, it's actually, this is the task specific component of your NLP system. So what I want to stress here is that there, you'd have a different prediction head depending on your task. If you're doing document classification or NER or question answering, that top component will change. But the beauty of this paradigm that I'm showing you now is that the one language model is able to do lots of these different tasks. So you can use the one BERT model to be the basis for classification, NER, or question answering. So what is it that a language model actually does? What do we mean when, when we're talking about modeling language? Um, in actually the most basic sense, a good language model is something that is able to guess words that are missing. So if a well-trained BERT model, for example, might get a sequence like this. Maybe it gets a, the sentence, Airbus is a something based in Toulouse. And if it has been trained well, and if it works well, it will be able to give you different, different confidences for different words that would fit into that gap. So it might say, okay, corporation is a word that would fit quite nicely in here. Company is a word that might fit quite nicely in here. Um, but business, plain, and replacement don't quite really fit quite the same way. And so uh, it would kind of have, yeah, this, this distribution over potential candidates that would fit into the gap. 
why is this why does this help with a language model why do language models perform this task what does it actually do for us well um language models are built on they work because of something on a linguistic side known as distributional semantics the idea of it is kind of summed up quite nicely by the linguist jr firth who in the 50s said you shall know a word by the company it keeps and so what does he really mean by this what he's suggesting is that similar words occur in similar contexts. If I talk about, you know, I can say, you know, a dog is an animal with four legs. Um, and there's only a small set of other nouns that can replace dog there. You could say maybe an elephant is an animal with four legs or a cat is an elephant, or sorry, is an, is an animal with four legs. And this is what this is getting at. So similar words, occur in similar contexts. If two words mean something sort of similar, they are sometimes interchangeable. Um, yeah. In order to get a sense of context, in order to really characterize a context, we need to build a good representation of words. We need to be able to convert words into, yeah, these kind of vector representations. And once we have good representations of words and what they mean in a certain context, it's only then that we are able to do downstream tasks like NER and question answering. It's only then that we can do these tasks well. And so this is really what a language model is trying to do. It's really trying to model, uh, yeah, what words mean, how to fill in gaps, which words are similar to each other. And yeah, um, once again, this is what it looks like. And I, want to, I just really want to stress this again. This language model component in the center is the part which has a very general understanding of language, that it just gets general semantics um, about different words. It's not yet trained to perform a specific task. And that's what the prediction head is there for. This is really the, uh, the, the big difference between the two and how they kind of yeah, interact. So yeah. We saw already some downstream tasks and how um, what we can do with them in the demo, but just to kind of uh, reiterate this point, downstream tasks are, yeah, this is much like something that is much more practical in the world of NLP. Maybe you have this input text down the bottom, San Diego Zoo lays off 2000 animals and you pass it into a language model BERT and then you pass the output of BERT to a prediction head so that you might form name density recognition and recognize that San Diego Zoo is an organization, 2000 is an ordinal. Or maybe you pass on that output to a classification head and say, this text sounds quite a lot like a parody. Yes. Um, yeah, at this point, I'm wondering whether maybe we could, we should take some questions or um, we could maybe, or if we should save those up for later. Yeah, there's some questions here. Um, Arland uh, was asking, do you have an opinion on the star space and word embedding algorithm from Facebook? Which seems to be very interesting for a very specific domain cover. Um, to be honest with you, I'm not very, I'm not actually very aware of the star space word embedding algorithm. Um, just by the sounds of that, it sounds like something that is maybe like a variant of word to vec or something like that, or um, maybe Maybe if you could write like a two sentence kind of description of it, I could um, get a sense of sort of what it's about. But yes, yeah, I, I actually don't really know I, what this no, is. No worries. I invited Arlen to um, to join us in the panel for a second. Arlen, can you talk? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you perfectly. Can you explain okay. a little bit more about uh, the star space word embedding algorithm from Facebook? Yeah, I, I have been using it. I mean, I'm not very familiar with it, but I've been using it for some very specific domain, let's say classifications. Mm -hmm. And the, the, it basically blew away all other results, uh, no matter what you use, word embeddings, all kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the case where you had actually had very specific, uh, you know, domain language, right? Because mm -hmm. the general, let's say, word embeddings and, and also... Um, let's say um, the, the bird corpora language models, they capture a lot of general information, right? But when, when you have a very specific task, then this general information is not that, that useful. And this just was very useful for, for my use cases. That's why I was asking if, if you have any experience with it. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, no, sorry, I haven't had any experience with it, uh, but 
Uh, yeah, it, from what I can tell, it seems like sort of an extended version of um, sort of what I call like uncontextualized word embedding. So things like word to vec and glove, which um, are essentially kind of a maybe. Actually, I don't want to talk too much about it in case I've got this wrong. But maybe no, I just so want to stress one point, which is that I talk a lot about these deep learning models, which are quite like uh, heavy duty um, tools. But they're not, I think I really implore everyone to try out whatever they can, because these models are not the solution to everything. They're a solution to a subset of the tasks out there. Um, but yeah, I, I'm sure these, the star space has a um, very different approach, which is going to be very useful in a different set of tasks. So maybe what, you can look up, maybe you can look up for that, um, so for a specific model from Facebook at another session. I think it's a good idea. Yeah, so what, what I understood from the model is that it, it basically calculates a word embedding with respect to a specific, let's say, outcome function. Maybe that's the, one of the main differences mm -hmm. that uh, if this outcome, it basically considers, let's say, the task of classification already very, very uh, early and uh, then embeds the word so that you can be basically optimal with respect to a specific task. Interesting. Um, the way that you describe it sounds to me sort of like... Um, the task of fine tuning with these language models. So as I said, um, when you just have the language model by itself, it's a very general understanding of language. But once you start training it with one of these prediction heads, because uh, there's, there's two levels of training here. Once you start training with one of these prediction heads, um, the weights inside the language model will actually shift over time so that the, um, so that, that language understanding is a little bit more focus towards your task. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Arlind. Um, we have um, two more questions. Uh, Chetan actually had an idea. Chetan, can you talk? I made you put you in the panel list as well. Chetan? Yeah, he referred to uh, MBART. Um, but mm -hmm. can you tell me what, in what kind of context you actually wanted to, to ask? I can't hear Chetan right now. I can't hear him as well. No, it's yeah. Chetan, can you talk? Yes, I just I have compared about the like uh, it's, uh, BRT models and uh, MBRT. It's uh, like a uh, um, it's about Facebook. They have like a published paper in January two thousand twenty. Uh -huh. So it was latest, and they, it's uh, about multilingual, and they basically they use like a there's some for. I can say it's about the noise uh, when there is some noise exists in the test uh, and it automatically like a uh, predict the uh, proper words. Mm -hmm. So MBRT. Okay, so let me just have a quick read of your comment here, doesn't it? Okay, interesting. Um, I actually saw this model coming up in the Hugging Face repository that uh, we work with sometimes. Um, but it's not something that I fully understand yet. Um, thanks very much for pointing me out to it. I think I will have to have a look at it some other time and um, maybe try to respond in the, the meetup chat or something like that when it makes a bit more sense. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, Antonio, um, I put you also here on the panel. Okay, I'm here. What was your question? Can you just repeat it? My question is, if I want to train a bird lo a language model in my language, how many examples do I need uh, at the minimum? Um, yeah, so we've been doing quite a lot of the, this kind of work um, in trying to train uh, yeah, language models from scratch. Um, I mean, ultimately, the more the better. Uh, XLM Roberta is trained on something like two terabytes of raw text data, which is Ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. Um, our German BERT model was trained on about uh, 15 gigabytes of raw text data. Um, but we've seen models trained on as little as maybe like, like a couple hundred megabytes, preferably close towards a gigabyte. Um, yeah, really ultimately it's the more the better and obviously the, the quality of the data is important and what domain it comes from. Um, but at the very, very least, at least a couple hundred megabytes, I would say. Yeah, I, I think I have here like about 15 gigabytes. 
-hmm. So it's not Cholero, yeah? 15 gigabytes is a good, yeah, you, would, you could definitely train a good model out of that. Uh, can I ask which language you're working with? Portuguese. Portuguese, okay, cool. Portuguese, cool. So you're located in Portugal? No, no, in Brazil. In Brazil, oh, Brazil, well, I can. <laughs> well, then I would actually encourage you to look at um, both the XLM paper and the XLM Roberta paper, because they talk about how they managed to uh, collect their data for a hundred different languages. But uh, I'm sure Portuguese in, is in that set and you could um, yeah, augment your data set with their data as well. Yeah, but, uh, I, my, my data is uh, exclusively from social media conversation. Right. I want to make like uh, the, the model really proper for informal speech. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, sometimes I worry if they train the model in very uh, formally, grammatically correct, mm -hmm. which I will have some problem. Is that a worry? Uh, I think it really depends on what you want to do with it. Um, I, I think actually it's very cool that you're training one on social media stuff because we've trained models on just Wikipedia text and then we maybe want to classify some uh, tweets. And uh, funnily enough, emojis don't come up in Wikipedia. And so our model is completely unable to handle that kind of stuff. Okay. So yeah, it really depends on just what you want to do with it. I get a lot of emojis in my data and I was like, what the hell I do with that? Then I, I found this uh, library, the emoji that turns the emojis into text. And maybe uh, I could use this uh, text as a token. I was thinking uh, in that way. Yeah, cool, cool. That sounds good. Inter interesting problem, Antonio. Thanks for sharing that with us. Uh, I have uh, the last question here from Melinda as well. Melinda, uh, you, uh, you are doing simplification on your on daily job, right? Yes, that's right. So what is your question to, to Brandon? Uh, my question is if NLP or language models right now are also looking into text simplification, uh, why I'm asking that the, the background to this question is that I operate on plain language and plain language is always simplifying. It's done by people. And right now I'm using uh, NLP in forms of a CAT system, which is using um, machine learning. But unfortunately, it doesn't work for simplification. So my question is, is the C in the industry also looking into the simplification bit of the matter? There's certainly interest in this. Um, but the, the way that I usually see this problem um, is, the, the closest thing that I know of is a uh, text summary. So maybe you have like a paragraph and you want to shrink it down into just a sentence or two that tells you what's going on there. Um, or for example, headline writing. So um, I'm trying to remember which data sets there are there. But uh, I think, yeah, if, if you look into this sort of area, this, I believe there's a CNN headlines uh, text summarization data set. But that operates in English, right? It does, yes. Yeah. Well, I have two issues because I operate in not only in English, in, in very different other uh, languages. Yeah. And, and right now we are actually trying to create a standard for simplifi simplifying languages, all kinds of languages. Mm -hmm. And there is, in Berkeley, they're working on a system on text simplification. But so mm -hmm. far, I've not come across any other people who really look into the text simplification in terms of, you know, data, taking data sets from available corpuses and stuff like that. So I'm just sort of blind because I have no idea who is really looking into that because, I mean, NLP can be, could be very helpful in that respect. Um, yeah, sorry, this isn't, text simplification isn't something that I've, uh, come across as much as like, summarization and things like that. Um, let's, yeah. let's take it as an open question here for anyone who is participating at the moment. So Melinda has asked uh, if you have experience with simplification or in different languages. If you have something, just write to her or send, uh, send suggestions where she could have a look at. Melinda, what kind of languages are you working with uh, besides of English? Um, German, French, Italian, and um, Turkish. Turkish, okay. Thanks for, thanks for that. So um, if, if someone has an idea um, that you could have a look at, please 
posted here. It's just, you know, my, my question is not so much, you know, simplification in terms of, I already do that. But yes. My interest is NLP, uh, if there are any models available or companies who actually look into that specific problem mm. of text simplification, you know, if it's not available for all those languages, I, I, I'm not bothered as long as I could get some information on text simplification and NLP. Yep. By simplification, do you mean something like rewriting a paragraph so that it's in like easier language or do you That's mean right. rewriting it? That's right. Okay. Rewriting. It's called post-editing. Uh, so, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I would say the summarization is the closest to it, but I think that is not exactly what you're after because summarization, you lose a lot of the detail. Yeah, no, that, I'm not after that, no. Yeah, yeah. I'm um, after building up training sets, you know? I mean, yeah. I, I will, I'll make it short, you know? We already worked on it, so we already created data sets, we already mm -hmm. created examples, but we have no model to use. Okay. Okay, and then in that case, I would say that what you're interested in is like a sequence to sequence models here, because um, you want something that reads in a text and is able to kind of generate a text based off of it. That's um, right. Is or make suggestions. Maybe... Yeah, sure. Uh, is there some way that we can maybe um, like a reminder so that at the end of this call, I can send you some links to some sequence to sequence models and the literature around that? Cool, yeah. Melinda, you can also please check chat at the moment because uh, some have already posted some ideas. Lovely, uh, You Thank can have you. a look at. Thank you. Uh, yeah, sure, you're welcome. So, Brandon, yes. all questions seem uh, to be asked uh, for now. Yeah, okay, then let's continue on. So, we've been talking about NLP systems and we went through some examples here. Um, yeah, I just want to kind of give a little bit of a timeline of how we're at the point that we are now. So um, I think a lot of people are probably familiar with things like word to vec and glove. Uh, these are embedding models which uh, are trained on word co-occurrence statistics, like which word occurs in my corpus near which other word. Um, and these were very, very effective. This is a very, um, very powerful way to kind of get some insight into the semantics of a sentence. But there was a pretty strong problem with this, which was that these vectors are uncontextualized. And what I mean by this on a high level is um, I could be talking about, you know, I really love eating apples and apple a day keeps the doctor away. But in another sentence, I might say apples shares drop by 10%. And in these cases, I'm talking about two very different apples. But these models have just the one vector for whenever the word apple comes up. And so you can see how this model is not very, is not exactly sensitive enough for a real kind of fine grained language understanding. Um, a lot of NLP researchers saw this and worked on various solutions to try to remedy this. So thinking very much about uh, the ELMO model and then ULM fit. And these are contextual language models. And these would give a different representation for Apple the company and Apple the fruit. They are based on the LSTM, a recurrent neural network architecture, which was very powerful, uh, but also quite inefficient in some ways. So uh, it's very hard to parallelize the, uh, the computation that's involved in an LSTM. And it also struggles with very long sequences. It kind of tends to forget what came before after a while. Um, back in, I think it was about 2017, perhaps, uh, there was a paper that came out called Attention is All You Need. And this was a radically different architecture uh, based on something called the transformer block and uh, that relied very heavily on the self-attention mechanism. Um, it was state-of-the-art when it came out for machine translation and it solved a lot of these issues that the LSTM had. And it's this architecture which has been the basis for the latest generation of language models out there. So as I said, BERT was a big breakthrough. There are lots of variants that came after it. Um, but BERT is a bi-directional transformer-based language model. The bi-directional just means that uh, when it predicts a word, it can see both the words that come before and after it. Um, these models are very powerful and parallelizable 
and um, for kind of what I would consider the hottest toss in NLP right now, they represent the state of the art. So what is BERT? Um, BERT is this paper here. It's a pre-training of deep bi-directional transformers for language understanding. It was written by uh, Jacob Devlin and his team at Google AI Language. It's released in November, 2018. And yeah, as I mentioned, it uh, achieved state of the art in 11 different NLP tasks. And uh, it's been so influential and so groundbreaking that Google have actually recently implemented in its uh, search system. Uh, that when you, yeah, when you type in a certain type of uh, query into Google search, uh, BERT models are engaged and try to understand exactly what you're asking for. Um, yeah, it's, you guys might have even heard about it in the newspapers. It was covered there and Pandu Nayak, who is the Google VP of search, called it the single biggest positive change in five years. So this is a pretty big deal. These, Google thinks that these, sees the value in these models and um, it's transforming how they uh, perform their search. And as I said, BERT was one of the first models, uh, was, it was a very big breakthrough and has actually been an inspiration for a lot of models to come. And here is just a quick summary of it. Um, I won't go through all of them, but what I do really wanna focus in on today are two of these. As I mentioned, there's XLM and there's a uh, Roberta, which is the architecture behind XLM Roberta. I will explain a little bit more about what they involve as we go on. So yeah, now that we have an idea of sort of how language models fit into uh, the world of NLP, I want to talk about a specific type of language models, which are the multilingual language models. Um, when BERT came out, uh, the team that created BERT also created a variant known as multilingual BERT, or referred to as just MBERT. Um, it covers 104 different languages, and it has a vocabulary size of 110,000 tokens, different tokens. These tokens cover inputs from every language that it covers. And uh, I want to differentiate these from the single language BERTs, such as German BERT or uh, Camembert, which is the French version of it. Uh, I want to stress that multilingual BERT can be fed any one of these 104 different languages, potentially even um, kind of code switched. So even like sentences which have a little bit of French and a little bit of English perhaps. Um, and this contrasts with German BERT or Camembert and models of this style, which are only able to deal with uh, the one language. Facebook's team created their own version of multilingual models. And the first one that came out, to, uh, I will refer to as XLM 100. This is their XLM. Um, they also have this a kind of a similar architecture and they also use this Wikipedia data and they cover a hundred languages. But what I really want to talk about is what came out in November in 2019, which is XLM Roberta. This is their update to their original XLM 100 and it is scaled up um, it is trained on much more data. It's a much more powerful model. And just the results that I've seen on it have been quite impressive actually. But um, yeah, first thing I wanna to point to is that this diagram here, uh, which might be, I hope it's not too small to read, but what we can see here is the size of the data sets which are used to train XLM Roberta. That's represented by these blue bars. And then the orange bars underneath are the size of the data sets used to train XLM 100 and also multilingual BERT. Um, each bar represents one language. And you can see this is actually a logarithmic scale. So actually in a lot of these languages, we're talking about orders of magnitude more data. And uh, yeah, they managed to gather a ridiculous amount. It's over two terabytes of raw text data from the common crawl. Uh, which they used to train XLM Roberto, which must have taken a huge amount of compute power and a lot of time. Uh, I just want to do a quick comparison of these different models. So yeah, we have multilingual BERT, XLM 100, XLM Roberto. Uh, they all cover somewhere around 100 languages. Um, they each have a slightly different vocabulary size. So multilingual BERT uh, recognizes about 110,000 different tokens. XLM 100 has 95,000. 
and Axelam Roberta has 250,000. Um, they're all based on this transform architecture that I briefly mentioned, uh, which was part of the attention is all you need paper. And they differ a little bit in terms of their training objectives in uh, how they're trained exactly. Um, multilingual BERT in typical BERT fashion has two training objectives. They're called mass language modeling and next sentence prediction. Whereas XLM Roberta has mass language modeling and translation language modeling. And XLM Roberta has only mass language modeling. And um, the reason for this is because of one of Facebook's other papers, uh, which was a more robust version of BERT called Roberta. And they found that actually this next sentence prediction head that uh, multilingual BERT was using and regular BERT was using uh, actually didn't give them much of a performance boost. And they realized that they could actually get rid of it and still maintain a lot of uh, performance. And as I mentioned, um, the multilingual BERT and XLM100 are trained on a Wikipedia corpus and XLM Roberta is trained on this much bigger common call corpus. Um, yeah, it's actually, it's, it's very interesting reading these papers. And I think it's just always been a, it's been a very ambitious idea to have like one model which can do all these languages. It's been very cool to see, very cool idea um, that has been kind of brought forward. And in XLM Roberta, I think there's actually some very nice analysis of what it implies or what it, yeah, what it entails if you start training models which cover more than one language. And um, yeah, their basic findings were that low resource languages benefit from other languages. Um, and also that when you have a model that can handle a lot of languages, it, you might get to a point where the model starts to saturate a bit. It gets harder and harder to learn more and more languages. Um, but just to give an example of this uh, low resource languages benefiting from other languages, the XLM 100 paper gives the example of Hindi and Nepali. So Hindi and Nepali are both written in the same Devanagari script, but there is a lot more Hindi out there than there is, um, than there is of Nepali. And so you can see kind of how, uh, these, I should also emphasize that these two languages are related, that they're quite close, uh, a lot of the words share very similar meanings. And so you can kind of see instinctively how training a model um, on both Hindi and Nepali would give some benefit to the model's understanding of Nepali. You just will just see more of this related language and be able to make better sense of Nepali. And on the graph on the right here, we kind of see this at play. So uh, the blue bars represent uh, the performance of these models, sorry, the performance of these models, yeah, on low resource languages. The orange bars are the performance of uh, languages which are highly resourced, and then the gray is kind of an average. And down the bottom on the x-axis, we have the number of languages that the model supports. So they basically trained different models which supported a different number of languages and saw how um, performance on different languages evolved over time. And you can see at about 15 that by adding some more languages, a broader spread of languages, the performance of the low resource languages can increase. Just like I mentioned with Hindi and Nepali, that's the effect that we're seeing there. But as you get to higher numbers of languages, like up to 60 and 100, you see that these models start to saturate a bit, that they've kind of reached close to their limit of how many languages they can really keep absorbing and overall performance starts to dip somewhat. So we have these multilingual models now and we want to see how well they do. And we really want to evaluate them, not just on one language, but over a set of languages. And this is what we're gonna look at here. Um, there are three tasks that XLM Roberta and multilingual BERT were evaluated on. Oh, they were actually evaluated on more, but I want to I want to talk just about these three for now. And uh, I want to talk first about uh, XNLI, which is a classification task, but it's um, it has a very interesting structure. XNLI has an English training set, but dev and test sets in uh, I think about fifteen different languages. 
And the way, uh, one way that you can approach this task is through something called zero shot learning. The idea is that you get this multilingual model, any of these that we have here, and we train it to perform this classification task on the English training data. But then once it's trained, we evaluate straight away on a different language, even though it has not been trained on that language for this specific task. So this is what we refer to as zero shot learning. And um, we see that XLM Roberta um, yeah, performs significantly better than the other models out there. Um, I've also included here XLM Roberta base, which is a slightly smaller version of XLM Roberta, uh, something that's more kind of in line with the size of multilingual BERT to give maybe a somewhat fairer comparison. But XLM Roberta is, yeah, um, the biggest model that they made uh, and their most effective one. So you can see yeah, in XL XNLI, it, it performed very, very strongly. Um, they also did some evaluation on the Connell 2002 and 2003 data sets, which are named entity recognition in a handful of different languages. Uh, in these cases, there is training data in each of the languages. And so this is not a zero shot case. Um, but here also, XLM Roberta outperforms the models that came before. Uh, it outperforms M, uh, multilingual BERT, and uh, they find that scaling up to the full size XLM Roberta also gives performance gains. And then there is the MLQA data set, which is another um, data set which has uh, data in multiple languages, but the focus being on zero shot learning. So there are dev and test sets in a range of different languages, uh, but not uh, the train set. And once again, here we see a pretty big jump across all these. So yeah, it's, it's pretty impressive that like a model that has not seen a question answering sample in say uh, French is able to be trained in English for question answering and then perform decently well on this, uh, on this transferred language, this target language. So yeah, it's, uh, you'd expect that a model that's been trained on this many languages to have some sort of uh, multilingual capabilities. But the authors of XLM Roberta were also very interested in how it stacks up against models which have been trained on just one language. So for example here, uh, they are comparing um, XLM Roberta against BERT, against XLNet, and against uh, the original Roberta. Those three only support one language each, English, and XLM Roberta covers a hundred different ones. And they evaluated it on uh, GLUE. And as you can see down the bottom, GLUE is a benchmark. Uh, it's a collection of 11 different tasks for analyzing NLP systems. And these tasks include things like sentiment analysis, textual similarity, uh, and also text classification. And um, yeah, you can see that XLM Roberta is actually even better than BERT Large when it comes to English. It's very close to XLNet and uh, yeah, a bit worse than Roberta. But that's like, we're only talking about 1% difference here. And uh, that's quite impressive for a language that has that much flexibility, I would say. So we saw at DeepSet, we saw uh, these models and we thought that this was really quite exciting actually, quite cool to see and as I mentioned, we've been working quite a lot on, um, on building German language models. And we wanted to see how it stacked up against um, some of our German language models. So we wanted to evaluate it as well. And we had two tasks that we were focused on. We had a German eval 18, which is a hate speech detection task. And also a German eval 14, which is a named entity recognition task. And here you can see that on these two, XLM Roberta actually outperformed obviously multilingual BERT, uh, as well as our single language German BERT um, and set new state of the arts in, in both of these. Um, outdoing Flair, for example, and also the uh, submission from TU Wien um, for these tasks. So all in all, um, yeah, I, from my experience with uh, XLM Roberta, I think it's a really, really impressive model. The performance is staggering. The 
capabilities for uh, zero shot learning and so on are, are very exciting. Um, one caveat I might give is that XLM Roberto is a big model. This is a um, very computationally intensive model and we had to use um, big GPUs for this. So on Amazon AWS, we were using uh, NVIDIA V100s, which are just about the biggest um, uh, deep learn, like graphics accelerators you can get there. Um, so maybe not yet at a point where these are the most efficient uh, production ready models out there, but if you're looking to just for the performance, looking to see what's possible, it's really quite impressive. So I just kind of want to recap um, why, yeah, why multilingual models matter, uh, which is that they show some pretty impressive performance for languages which don't have uh, as many resources, who, uh, for example, don't have big corpora assembled already. Um, and I think this is really important because NLP is not just about English. NLP is something that could, or that should be applied to just about any language out there. The, uh, the benefits that it gives are something that, um, yeah, I would really like to see um, in all different parts of the world speaking different languages. Perhaps you are currently working on some kind of project and you're thinking about what sort of language model should be the basis of your NLP system. Um, if that's the case, I would actually encourage you to have a think about these multilingual models, maybe give it a go, see if it gives the kind of strength that it needs um, for your task. Because these sort of models of also offer a kind of future proofing. So maybe right now you're only working in English, but perhaps your product, your company, uh, you're looking to expand into different markets, different countries, different languages. These, langu these models will form um, the basis for that, will allow you to expand when you need to. And yeah, I think that uh, it's a really interesting area of research right now. I think that um, there's kind of a lot of focus in the cutting edge uh, of NLP to incorporate learnings from as many different types of tasks as possible. And um, I think actually it'll be, I don't think it's uh, so far out that we'll see in future the, that the best language models might actually also have to learn from lots of different languages. This is the way that we can scale up um, the training data for it. And this is the way that languages will, sorry, that language models will really get a true understanding of sort of the core principles of language and how it functions. And so uh, looking forward, as I said, I think that there is a lot on the horizon and I'm really quite excited for this. As I mentioned, I think zero shot learning is very cool. This is very definitely uh, how we're gonna leverage uh, multilingual models into the future and really opens up NLP for languages that maybe have not had so much attention so far. I think that there's a lot of very cool work in different styles of um, language models. Um, so actually Google has been doing a lot of very cool stuff on this recently. Google's T5 model um, treats every single task, whether it's a classification or NER, as a sequence to sequence task. So it reads in the text and instead of predicting just like sport as a, char uh, as a category, it will actually generate sport as an answer by doing a character at a time or type in S-P-O-R-T and that becomes its final prediction. It means that it's a very flexible model. Um, just in the last weeks, actually, Google also released Electra, um, which uh, is still a transformer-based language model, but it's trained in a much, much more efficient way and is uh, actually very close to state-of-the-art um, in a lot of different tasks. And I actually think this style of training will become standard come uh, into the future. This might replace things like uh, mass language modeling. And then a little bit further down the line, I think we're gonna start seeing uh, harder and harder natural language understanding tasks. And then um, I'm really, really excited to see when we start getting uh, multimodal agents, um, programs which are able to incorporate both text and uh, visual information, maybe even sound information and make decisions out of that. So um, yeah, this is what kind of keeps me excited about this field. I think that there's a lot that is coming in the very near future. And uh, there's a lot of very cool research going on there. And I think that uh, multilingual language models have a very important role to play in all of this. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much for listening. And uh, if you want to uh, yeah, keep in touch, uh, feel free to find me on LinkedIn and to also follow me on Twitter. Awesome, thank you. Uh, thanks for all the uh, explanations. Uh, of course, we have uh, already questions here again. Andrea, I gave you, uh, allowed you to speak. 
Uh, what's your link to NLP? Are you working in that area? Yeah, hi. Um, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Yeah. Hi, so yeah, I'm Matreya. Um, I'm actually, funnily enough, um, I, I'm from the University of Potsdam, so really close to Berlin. Um, and yeah, I'm studying essentially uh, uh, cognitive systems, so it's, it's related to NLP. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So Are yeah, I, right I'm sorry. Are you still studying right now? Yeah, I'm still studying right now. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. So I just have uh, two questions, uh, just on on towards the latter parts of uh, what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. So my first question is, you know, regarding zero shot learning and how that enables, let's say, more obscure or uh, low resource languages to be incorporated in the model. So. Um, from my understanding of zero-shot learning, um, I understand that it's actually the ability to learn on, on new languages also has to do with, let's say, similar morphology, similar syntax, also the characters of this new language being at least incorporated within the vocabulary. So wouldn't that still be a problem for, let's say, completely obscure languages which have a completely different character sets? I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that would still be a, an issue in incorporating those cases, right? So that's my first question. Um, my second question is regarding scalability. So um, in actually, so it, you talked a lot about the cross-lingual situation. In the monolingual situation, um, Google has been going in the direction of trying to now scale down some of the models because I think at the moment that's the biggest barrier to for let's say students or people who don't have such large resources, small companies to get into this game, um, into the, the large language models. So what uh, the recent models that came out we saw last year or even this year's Albert, for example, um, and even the reformer architecture. Mm -hmm. So my question is for the um, cross-lingual case, um, I'm not aware of this, but would you know of any cases or developments where they're trying to scale down um, the number of parameters such that these models can be available to, let's say, smaller players like students who wants to do, uh, yeah. you know, research? So, yeah, thank you. That's my question. Yes. Uh, yeah, very interesting questions. Um, so let me cover the first one, which was about uh, zero shot learning. Um, yeah. So more generally, I think I would just call zero shot learning um, sort of like, how do I put this? transferring knowledge from one language to another and what you mentioned uh, is quite important that yeah like different languages might have very different morphology might have totally different yeah uh, roots and might have even different writing systems but actually the hope of these models is that of these multilingual models is that they learn something kind of a little bit more abstract they might learn sort of like um the concept of a noun or the concept of sort of like uh, agreement or like kind of these relationships between words which are independent of the very form of the language, independent of what script it uses or independent of whether it has related words or not. So what I'd say is that zero-shot learning actually still does have a uh, potential for these, um, for, for languages that are very distantly related. Uh, it's probably going to be a little bit less efficient, less efficient in the transfer, but theoretically still very much possible. Um, and yeah, I think maybe I want to clarify one thing uh, when I talk about lower resource languages. As you can see in um, Excel and Roberta, they managed to um, scrape a lot of data for uh, languages that um, that yeah don't receive as much attention in NLP. And I think that's really awesome, and I think that's great because it really brings them into the game. I think the next step, which is really hard as well, is how to have data sets, downstream data sets, which are in lower resource languages. So um, for example, there is not a German question answering data set. And this is what uh, zero shot learning can really offer. Zero shot learning can offer at least some basic uh, performance without having this uh, non-English uh, downstream data set. So that's kind of what I'm most excited about there. Um, and your second question was about scaling down these models. Yeah, exactly. Um, there is, yeah, there's, there's kind of a crazy trend right now where there are some teams who are just building absurdly large models that kind of, you know, that even with an AWS account, you might struggle to, uh, to set up. And yes, Albert is definitely an attempt to scale down, which I think is really cool. Um, so I don't know of a specific scaled down model just for uh, multilingual models, but there's actually a lot of work into a certain technique called distillation. 
So the idea behind distillation is I have a fully trained big network. Let's say it's uh, XLM Roberta and it already does well. Now we're going to call this one the teacher network. Now I'm going to initialize a smaller model, uh, which is much more efficient. And it is going to now be trained to copy what the big model does. And they found that this is actually a very efficient way of creating a model that does a lot of what the bigger one does, uh, but be in terms of parameter and compute much more efficient. So uh, yeah, distillation, um, distillbert. Um, the Hugging Face repository has a lot of these uh, processes uh, implemented. So yeah, I'd encourage you to check out a uh, model distillation. Thanks, Brandon. Um, Al and I, I just uh, edit you again. Uh, what was your question? Yeah, thanks, Brandon, for the great presentation. A lot of insights. Thanks a lot. Um, so my question is regarding, um, um, do you have suggestions how to incorporate the layout information in these uh, language models? One thing I'm always annoyed um, with these models is that uh, I think there are only uh, really two, three papers which, which try to somehow to incorporate the layout information and most of the text uh, which is available there, like already Wikipedia, for example, mm -hmm. um, has a lot of structure, right? It has headings, it yeah. has subsections, and um, no one would, would, would be able to actually read this information without considering the layout, right? So um, what would you suggest would be the easiest way to, for example, use um, your, your farm framework to incorporate also like layouts of uh, word, like position um, and, and width yeah. and height of the word, et cetera. Yeah, this is a very interesting one. Um, and something that people are thinking about a lot, especially, um, especially in the range of uh, like OCR. So I think that like we can definitely build programs which are able to read text, but there's the challenge there is really how do we represent text in space? There's not, as in like in a, in a layout, there's not really kind of a, a uniform format that can really cover that all. I think there are some attempts to get towards that. And um, one, of the, one of the things I've seen is that um, Google has a question answering data set called Natural Questions, which, um, which actually incorporates all the HTML information. So we're, it's, it works on Wikipedia data, but it actually has all of the yeah, uh, open and close fields. So I'm not very good with HTML, but um, yeah, basically HTML, it has the HTML structure. And when you perform that task, you have to uh, look to the tables and be able to extract information from tables and understand the relations there. Um, yeah, to be honest with you, I have not seen a lot of language models that really take into account this information. Um, I think that's often cleaned away. And I don't think it would be trivial to incorporate this information because models like BERT rely on sentence boundaries very heavily. And it's not exactly clear to me what a sentence boundary within a table would be like or how you might want to divide that up. Um, I Yeah, I think right now the, probably the, the approach I would go would be to treat that almost separately. But uh, yeah, this is definitely still a very open and very difficult area of research right now. So one, one suggestion, or maybe you can tell me if, if it would make sense to do it that way or not. What about like um, actually now, let's say, uh, incrementing a token, not only just as a token, but actually let's say using token and augmenting it in, in let's say various space dimensions mm -hmm. and considering it as a, uh, well, it's 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 uh, mostly the same token, but in a different position or a different you know position on, on a page or whatever you use as your two-dimensional field, yeah. and then basically use the same mechanism that way. Mm -hmm. So basically, if I if I use um, named entity uh, extraction, for example, and I I have as input that this kind of token is on the upper left of your of your let's say paper input. Yeah. Then well, it should be quite easy, right, to learn that it's a different meaning of this of this uh, name uh, yeah. than if it is in the middle of a sentence, right? Right. Yes. Yes. Definitely. I think um, that's actually quite cool. Quite quite cool an idea to give that sort of information in. My only issue is whether uh, how well the model would digest this. So 
when the when you train the language model and it's looking at a piece of text um, I mentioned this kind of context length issue um, the model will actually look at sort of about 512 tokens of your document. So let's say in this new document, it's like it's kind of the top 512. But once it's kind of finished processing that and sort of updated its own weights, it will completely forget that. And then it will look at the next block. And this might not be an issue in some cases, but I can imagine, for example, if you had a footnote, let's say something kind of referred to, um, yeah, if you had a footnote that was written down the very bottom, then this model would not be able to kind of draw the link between these two. So it really also depends hugely on sort of the layout and uh, what you learn there. But if you're getting like a form, maybe like a layout that kind of repeats itself very much and has very strong conventions, um, like, I don't know, like every page has a table on the right or something like that, and always in the same position, then maybe there's something to be done there. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Arlene, for your question. Uh, we have Alexander here um, in the panel as well. Alexander, you're working with, uh, with uh, text as well, right? With um, Yeah, yeah. Digital uh, assistance. So I, I was, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, so my question was, uh, uh, like you mentioned, that this uh, Alexander Bird is quite a heavy model, uh, and it's trained on a tremendous amount of data, but have you had any experience with the retraining it or like fine tuning on a different data set or with different objective or with different tokenization? Like how, how feasible would that be? Sure. Um, so yeah, let me just start by saying that there's, uh, there's training from scratch. So like you can like initialize a model which can't do anything yet, but then you train it and then it becomes, it understands language a bit. And this is what XLM Roberta did. Um, they did this on the two terabytes of the data. Uh, I wouldn't, I, we, we just don't have the resources to replicate something like that. Um, that kind of scale is far too high. But something you can do, which I think you mentioned, is fine tuning. So what you could do is start with a Roberta, which already has all this learned information. And maybe you have a lot of legal text. And you then continue that training using this legal text. And that is computationally much more affordable, much more uh, reasonable. Um, I mean, it really depends on the model, it depends on the data, depends on what you want to achieve. Um, but yeah, not like training language models is still a very, very intensive task. Um, we're talking about in, in the cloud using multiple like top end GPUs running for like, um, days, if not weeks, uh, just for a kind of a medium sized model. Um, so maybe to give you a, a bit of a, an idea, we trained um, German BERT on about 15 gigabyte of text. This is a model that's smaller than XLM Roberta. And uh, to get it to train well, we used a TPU, which is kind of even more powerful than GPUs. And we trained it for nine days nonstop. Um, that's the kind of scale that we're talking about here for just a medium size model, really. Um, and if you want to train on a different loss function, yeah, by all means, you can definitely try it out. Um, the code for training these models is usually open source and usually quite well written. And I could definitely see that you could add a different loss function, potentially even a different training objective. Um, certainly doable. What about different tokenization, like you, uh, I guess for German, for instance, it could be beneficial to have like a smaller uh, token, like sub word level uh, kind of sentence piece or some yeah. other more interesting tokenization. Yeah, so this is, um, this is, yeah, really the challenge. So I think some people might ask like, why would you train from scratch when you can just fine tune? And the thing that you can't change once you've started training from scratch is the vocabulary and the tokenization. So really the, the biggest driver for wanting to train from scratch should be that you want to create a new vocabulary. Um, and yeah, definitely like, um, yeah. So if I, if I took XLM Roberta now and then uh, 
wanted to train for another language which was in a completely different script that XLM Roberto had not seen, that would probably fail quite badly. And that's the kind of case where I would, would want to train from scratch. Thanks, Alexander. Arne, do you have another question? Yes. Um, so do you run uh, your models um, also live in production after you train them for a specific task? Or do you um, rather use them in an, in an offline, let's say, uh, session to get more information and prepare it for some, let's say, real queries? Because the issue I've noticed, uh, like the, the most of the, let's say, really these sophisticated uh, larger models, yeah. like even on, on runtime, uh, let's say question answering, you can, you can answer a couple of uh, requests per second or something like this, uh, which is which just does not really scale for a proper system. Yep. Exactly. You're right. You're totally right there. Um, so ultimately we do a bit of both. Um, so yeah, a lot of the times we're just benchmarking these models, seeing how well they do, how well they fit our case. Uh, but actually, yeah, it's, I'm glad you brought up question answering because this is something that uh, we're focused on scaling as well. So the farm repository that I showed you is something that, um, yeah, is really just the modeling side of it, but we kind of have a, another repository that uh, kind of goes on top of that. Uh, it's called Haystack. Um, can maybe just quickly pull up a link to this. And the idea of Haystack is to use these transformer models and perform question answering on a big corpus of text. Maybe you have like hundreds of documents, probably thousands, if not more, and you want to ask a question and get your answer within this. This is what we're working on with Haystack. Um, there is a lot of, um, yeah, engineering in trying to, um, scale this up. Uh, and in terms of, uh, the models themselves, obviously that will become more demanding as well. But one nice thing about it, I guess, is that when you're performing inference, um, it's not as intensive on the GPU. And we found that this is something then that we can actually run, uh, live and in production. Okay, so maybe I can just good. send you this link. Uh, I'll type out. this into the chat. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks thank you. Thanks for your question. The last question, and um, it's uh, it very much uh, fits to uh, us being AI Swiss. Uh, which model approach would you suggest for Swiss trim, which is much more tricky than trim oh, itself? Interesting. Um, that's curious. I think it depends somewhat on sort of what data you have. Oh, actually, um, uh, I hope I'm not offending anyone saying this, but am I right in saying that is, is, is Swiss at all close to Bavarian German? Not really. No, no, no. Okay, something else. Okay, fine. Um, yeah, it really depends on what sort of data you have. So if you happen to have a lot of Swiss German text collected somewhere, uh, if we're talking about in sort of gigabytes of it, I would say you could maybe train a model from scratch. Um, but if it's less than that, then I would suggest that perhaps you could, yeah, try XLM Roberta, or you could try our German bot model and you can fine tune it. So kind of continue training, uh, but get it to incorporate the Swiss text that you have. And um, the model should kind of adjust towards that. Thanks, Brent, for answering. You can stop screen sharing if you like. Um, so um, I'm not sure how we can, you, you actually sent me a link to the presentation. Uh, can I download it or shall we share the link to the presentation? Uh, you can share the link. Uh, share the link. Yeah. Okay, guys, so for anyone who would like to have a look at uh, it again, uh, you can. I will post it uh, in the text from the YouTube, um, the YouTube channel tomorrow. Uh, thanks, Brandon, again, for just taking the time and sharing your experience. Uh, awesome that you uh, just took the time to do so. And thanks for being so kind to answer all the questions. Uh, thanks for having me. It was actually a lot of fun to talk to everyone. Yeah, I think it were pretty good questions uh, again. Uh, so last, last thing again. So since we will have another session, April the 23rd. So be prepared. We will talk about deep reinforcement learning. Uh, with uh, the colleague Zaurav Kaushek from Uber in San Francisco. He will be actually in San Francisco at that time. So we will have the lovely uh, ability to talk to him just using Zoom again. Um, 
so thanks again for all you just joining us today. It was awesome to have you as uh, as audience. Thanks for all the questions and engagement. I love it. I uh, hope we will see each other personally at some time when not that all coronavirus uh, stuff is over again and it's much more fun to meet, to meet in person. Thanks again. And yeah, thanks again, Brendan. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.